and because they weren't using the right visas, they yeah, the be, right film permits. The right yeah. filming permits, they were facing five years in prison. And they they'd actually been mm. so mm. when we got there, we were like, oh my God, what are we doing? And I don't think there's things that I can even say for like legal reasons. But like, you know what I mean? It was kind of a bit of a, an adventure when we were there. And we managed to track down someone who was working for a charity um, who was involved in this. He met him, jumped on the phone. He connected me to someone else and said, right, this is like a halfway home uh, where some escaped slaves are and you can go and visit them here. Um, you need a translator and sort of, you know, we put all this information in an email to a translator. Anyway, long story short, we, we sorted out another a translator because that one didn't really get back to you us. You didn't mention the part where I got forwarded to the uh, yeah. Thai government. Yeah, so, uh, while we, were there. <gasps> so I was we were oh, yeah. very close to putting that in the film, but we really didn't want to make it so much about our struggle um, yeah. when we were there to document these ex-slaves. Um, so that's how things got out that we were there. So we'd gone and filmed this. And we were originally intending to be there for about two weeks, you know, trying to get onto these boats, film these boats, film more, film, speak to more people, go to some of the shrimp farms. You know, ended up only being there for like two or two days or something. It's something ridiculous. Um, and whilst we were there, we were doing things so quickly because we know, we, you know, this is a bit of a weird, you know, a risky area to be filming. We don't really know what this halfway house really is, what their connections are, or if we're even safe doing this. Just trying to take precautions. We're doing the interview so fast, and bear in mind, like we're just coming with one tripod and two cameras just to not look like a big crew. And we're doing it so fast that we didn't have time for the translator to translate their answers. So he just had time to translate my questions over, but then, you know, they'd speak for a few minutes and then I'm off to the next one. And it wasn't until we came back to the UK, you know, after that whole ordeal, that we sent it off to someone to get translated. And then eventually, then we realized what they were saying to us. And it was like developing an old role of like film from your holiday that you've not seen the photos for in months and going like, you know, oh my Whoa. God, oh my God, this is what they've been telling us. One of the interviews, the interviewees, he, he smelled of a lot of alcohol. You can tell he'd been drinking and he was slurring his words. And I'm guessing because of the trauma of it all, he's now maybe resorting to alcohol. I thought it'd be one of the worst interviews, ended up being one of the better, one, like one of the most powerful. So yeah, that was that was an interesting experience for us, you know, as filmmakers experiencing this and just also hearing what they were saying. Wow, that's crazy. Um, I wanted to just because I know a lot of our listeners are very involved in animal husbandry, and there there's a big conflict I think between how do we still enjoy our lives, what are our ideals, how do we save the world, and and people get very. Uh, they get angry and cagey when, when the subject of vegetarianism or veganism is brought up. Talk to us a little bit about your finding out about there's no such thing as sustainability. I'm, I'm quipping. I, I know it's not no such thing. But how are people who are not maybe willing to jump to veganism or even vegetarianism, how are they supposed to navigate this or can they? Mm. It's an interesting question. I mean, for me, you know... The, the whole sustainability thing really comes down to when you look at these labels on, on fish products and they've, they've certified it as sustainable. When you look into it, there's actually, you know, the, these definitions are really loose. They can mean whatever you want them to mean. There's so many examples of where they've certified fisheries and actually they're very, very destructive. And when you say, well, hold on, how come this swordfish fishery is capturing two sharks for every swordfish you're capturing? They go, oh, um, well... There's another place around the world that, that, that also has work, really bad bycatch, so I guess this is normal. And it's just this kind of like flexible, meaningless stuff that, that was happening, it was coming up time and time again. And when you realize that, you know, if, if we have an analogy of the Amazon rainforest, and if we said 90% of the wildlife in the Amazon rainforest is now gone, we wouldn't say, well, let's sustainably kill the rest. We would say, right, let's leave it alone. And that's what's happening right, to right. our ocean. 90% of the large fish are gone, 90% of the fish populations are completely exploited. It, now's the time to sort of leave it alone. Now that's not to say if you know you're living in Alaska and you know that's your means of sustenance and you're doing it with a fishing line and a hook. You, sure, you're not going to have a huge impact on the sea at all. Same with those indigenous populations, whether it be in Liberia, like we show in the film, who's the leading threat to them putting food on their table is these huge European right. and Asian trawlers and tuna vessels that are coming in and taking everything. 
you know, that's the leading threat to them. So, but those people there on the coast aren't really, aren't having an impact. It's it's when you scale it up and you try to feed seven, eight billion people marine life, then it becomes unsustainable. But um, I think to just go back to your question, I think when it comes to what people eat, it's it's a very sensitive topic because people have their identity tied up with this. They've, they've done it their whole lives. They've got social lives around it. So it becomes people instinctively, I think, are very defensive when you start even just hinting at it. And I think that's why maybe the film has received so much pushback. And because because we are saying that, you know, one thing I haven't put forward yet from the environmental ocean conservation movement is the best thing we can do with the ocean is reduce or eliminate fish. Um, and that's probably why, you know, and we get sort of labels like it's vegan propaganda or right. stuff like that. And I just find that's an easy way to dismiss it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, if you think about, like, you know, vegan propaganda. I mean, we've been getting sort of propaganda for decades from the fishing industry who ha do have a vested interest in selling fish. Like, they do have a monetary incentive there. And I mean, like, if you think about what vegans are, I mean, they don't eat animals or they don't use animals or, um, or they do their best not to. I mean, they, they don't sort of, like get anything directly from like this right. like, vegan agenda they're not, I they're not getting rich off of saving yeah animals. i think we need to be a bit more skeptical of this vegan agenda because i think it's just something people slap on it to sort of dismiss it and i think that's you know that's um a bit of a shame really so and lastly my last point on that is that it's it's a common sense solution um and a lot of the people that are in the film that are the marine biologists and experts sylvia Earl, callum roberts so on and so forth the, none the, of them are none of them are vegan. They're not necessarily vegan, but they all agree this is actually the most powerful solution we all have is okay, why is the ocean running out of fish? It's because we're eating them. Wonder what we can do to help, you know. It's it's mm -hmm. pretty strange. It's, it's kind of really obvious when you when you think about it and you know, a message to reduce. I mean, the best way that we can help the ocean is just to leave it alone or do our best to, to leave it alone. alone. And it just seems quite a straightforward thing, yet it, it gets people's back up so much. It's like the moment in the Sea Spiracy when we talk about the uh the deep water horizon spill and the, on the end because the, the fishermen left it alone for so long because they were worried about the fish being contaminated with oil and, and all sorts of other stuff that was getting pumped into the ocean so one that's a a, a complete and horrible disaster for for the ecosystem but strangely the fish population started to come back because the fishermen weren't there anymore and i think that's it it's just a perfect case if you leave something alone the earth will look after itself it will it will, it will spawn again and it will, and it will replenish itself yeah, there's more evidence of this. I think there are specific places in the world where it has been left alone and it, it bounces back so fast when it's truly left alone. Um, to, and, and it does. The ocean has this amazing capacity to to rebound when it's truly left alone from, from fishing, yeah. It's also giving the, the smaller areas that don't have as much power the, the, the strength to give them another form of trade. You know, I realized in Egypt as well, that um, in, in, in and around Egypt and Sudan, that, that they've got some sanctuaries there where you can't fish because they make just as much money from scuba diving and from tourism. And uh, you know, it's like going to the point when you get these poachers who who, are, who make a living out of you know, killing elephants, but if you actually pay them a better, if you pay them the equivalent that they get paid when they introduce these hunters to these, uh, these endangered species, if you pay them the equivalent to protect them, then suddenly you get it. So you need to be able to, you know, empower these governments as well to protect their oceans and protect their seas um, in a way where they can still profit, where you know, so they can actually have their smaller scale fishermen come back and start, you know, working the land, working the sea. Exactly. It's just these kinds of simple switches that, if you just take five seconds, just think about the, the long term economics of it, because these fishermen will put themselves out of work. You know, whether whether the world decides to boycott fish or not, like eventually the fish populations will just collapse and they'll put themselves out of work. And just take, taking a moment to restructure things, there's a, there's a really small grassroots group in Nicaragua called Vital Actions. It's just like one guy working with the local community and a few others. And instead of those people poaching sea turtle eggs to, for their own survival and just eating them and selling them, he's paid them to protect the sea turtles, right? And it's actually created more opportunity for them and they're rescuing like weekly, like hundreds and hundreds of sea turtles just from this small switch to more like ecotourism type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, with so many opportunities and possibilities. I love that. Um, I, I want to know just because I think a lot of people are going to watch this and hopefully they'll be inspired, but I think there's a big portion of people that are going to watch this and be utterly devastated and just feel like uh, someone I was watching it with, I won't name names, they just came off and they're like, well, this is too huge. This is too much of a conspiracy. I can't do anything. It's just me. So it's not going to make a difference. I mean, just total despair, really. And and I get that. And I I think that 
it made me feel the sadly the cynical part of me made me feel as I was watching it going like, okay, so if we move to plants, but then how are we going to avoid over farming our land? You know, is there a plant conspiracy that we're going to be watching soon? Like, is it, is it just human nature and greed? Is it, I think we're having to examine much more than just, uh, what we're eating, but also just our, our consumption in general, because like I said before, the, the fish are not only going into our meals, but they're going into our cosmetics and God knows what else. Yeah. I think that it's plant conspiracy. I mean, so plant agriculture is just, it, it's just, far, far, far more efficient to feed a human population on plants as opposed to animal products because you're not having to pass those plants through a middle animal like cows and stuff. So yeah, who, who consume vastly larger quantities of plants than humans possibly could. So already we're, right. we're, we're growing enough plant crops to feed over 10 billion people already. It's just a lot of that is going through animals first. The, so we've got 7 billion human beings, but we've got like 70 billion land animals that we're feeding like cows eat more, they drink more, they need more land uh, to like graze on. So um, that's not to say that there aren't sort of, there aren't room for sort of human rights abuses and similar things that we found in the fishing industry in, you know, the avocado industry and in other um, plant mm-hmm. industries. Mm-hmm. But um, that being said, it isn't, it doesn't necessitate it though. Like with, when it comes to sort of like killing land animals, killing fish, there's definitely killing involved one way or another whereas like <laughs> to get plants it, it, it isn't necessary but that doesn't mean you know we can't get further transparency and know sort of what's going on in the food chain everywhere because yeah you're right it, you know there is i'm sure there's many things um that we still need transparency well, with. even if it is a pendulum I mean, it's about time the pendulum swung back the other way i mean if we keep going if the pendulum keeps going much that way then we're all going to die anyway <laughs> we're ruining the earth so isn't it that way we <laughs> in the next 40 years if we're worrying about over over consuming plants and there's too many animals in the world then we should face that problem <laughs> but right now yeah I mean, exactly yeah but it, it, if you've seen cowspiracy um which kip anderson the producer on this film created uh, with kicking coon year, a couple years ago you'll see that we need to actually farm we can actually rewild a lot of the land and still feed as much as many people with with, with human beings but that's a little bit outside of my expertise what do you see uh going forward what what is the plan for um for your production company for i mean you i'm assuming you guys are getting a lot of heat both probably hopefully good a lot of attention it's exciting what's next for you guys it was all completely unexpected. We're still trying to catch up um, with the response of the film. So I think we're still in the process of just trying to grow the team and, and sort of keep up with, you know, we want to keep um, sharing these stories, a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the film on our social media channels and continue this movement, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah de- definitely pushing forward with, with our, you know, a lot of the stuff that we want to continue this movement and this campaign beyond just the parameters of the film because mm-hmm. there's so much to be said on this. So we'll be definitely putting that on our, on our Instagrams and website and things like that. But we've got so many other documentaries we want to be making. And that's like the passion of mine, keeping making documentaries, we've got loads of stories in the pipeline. And um, yeah, that, that just continuing to expose stories that are uh, sort of the nexus of environmental and social issues. Those are things that really interest me a lot. It must be um, tough to talk about as well, I'd imagine, because if you've got anything up your sleeve where you're thinking you want to expose someone, you know, it's it's kind of like rule one of, of, of plotting a battle is you don't really tell anyone your battle plans before you go out and do it. You nailed it. It's kind of like the art of war. And if we reveal our cards too soon, yeah. it's kind of blown it. So, yeah, we've got we've got some big stories that we'd like to talk. Well, I'd love to talk about, but, you know, sort of hold, what's it called? Yeah. Hold this space? Not hold this space. Watch this space. <laughs> yeah, watch this space. <laughs> Hold this axe. My favourite quote in the art of war is "Axe weak when you are strong, and not strong when you are weak." And this is very key to to making a you know documentary. So, exactly, and we, we whenever we meet with resistance, that's when we keep going. Whenever someone tells us not to film, we film. Um, you know, that's that's exactly it. that's a good good message from the art of war. But is there anything with all this heat on you? I'm sure it's overwhelming. Thank you so much for doing our little podcast because we know you're probably doing a million things. But is there anything people aren't asking you? You get the same questions over and over again. Is there anything you wish people would ask you? I feel like we get asked everything. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, though. Yeah. That's good. So they're really digging into what you guys have to say. Yeah. I mean, I think I think overall, like we've had such a positive you know, I'd say 95% of what I'm seeing has been overwhelmingly positive. And so it's just, we've, we've been so overwhelmed with like some people saying that like they're changing certain things in their lifestyle. Yeah, that's, now that's, that's been involved. the most common thing we've heard actually is people writing to us saying that they're changing their lifestyle habits yeah. or they're cutting down fish or they're not eating fish anymore or, or yeah. any seafood. And, and, um, 
one of the one of the groups in the film, um, they've come out with a statement um, basically saying we don't think it's realistic to ask people not to eat fish, and and we think people should have the choice and everything. And it's almost like it's. Just